And then I have to figure out how I'm going to share this. So welcome. Welcome to our service enterprise orientation meeting. I'm going to be sharing my screen, um, but I'm going to, you know, encourage you guys to just kind of give your give your uh, selves the opportunity to keep your video on if you want to keep it off if you want to um, and just um, use the opportunity to interact a little bit. So maybe we'll go back and forth between sharing and not sharing if you guys don't mind that. Um, so just to start, I'll give you a, just a taste of what we're going to be looking at. Um, and this is where I get to share my screen. And you are looking at my email probably. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we'll stop that for the moment. Um, I would um, just want to introduce myself. I'm Polly Roach from MAVA, Minnesota Association for Volunteer Administration, as you may know. And um, I am the Volunteer Generation Fund Program Manager, which means I have the responsibility for working with programs that are funded by this Volunteer Generation Fund um, through the Corporation for National and Community Service. And our um, funding for this initiative service enterprise comes through the VGF grant and through national and community service. So you will know that because you're going to be getting requests for evaluation information. Of course, anyone that's worked with AmeriCorps or VISTA knows that our federal friends love to get data and this is no exception. So that's, that's why I want you to know about that. And I'd also like to introduce my um, colleague, Sheila Terrell, have her introduce herself and she's from Hands On Twin Cities. Thanks, Polly. Yeah, I'm a consultant with Hands-On, uh, working specifically with the Service Enterprise Program. Uh, I've been doing this work for about 20 years, so uh, been I've been around since the program was initiated from the national level, and and am proud to be part of the Hands-On team. We, um, with along with MAVA, are the the largest hub in the nation. So of course, I always like to tell Minnesotans that we're ahead of curve per usual. Yeah. As we always like to be. Agree. <laughs> okay. Okay. Looks like we've got Kate on the line uh, via audio. Welcome, Kate. Hi, Kate. All right, let's do it. Hello. <laughs> Hi, Kate. Here we go. Uh, we're gonna. I'm gonna. As I said, I'm gonna start sharing my screen. But we'll, you know, oh. just kind of keep our keep your um, audio on, and we'll, you know, if you want to have um, all the other folks um, pictures in the window. Um, just a couple housekeeping reminders. We are going to try to minimize background noise. So if you have any background noise, please mute yourself if your dog decides to come in and join the party. Um, and if you are, you know, if you want to add something to the conversation, feel, feel free to speak up. But if you don't want to interrupt the flow, just maybe if you want to use the raise your hand icon, that's um, you can find at the bottom of the participant screen. If you click on the participant list, um, that's there or just um, you know, kind of make a comment in the chat box as well, which you can open up. I'm, I'm assuming that by this point in time, people have a lot of familiarity with Zoom. Is that the case for you guys? Have you been using Zoom a lot? Seeing some head nods. Okay, because we're going to be using this as, a, as our service enterprise platform for the first time. So we are considering this as a pilot, and that's why there may be a couple bumps along the way, but we really value the feedback that we're going to be getting from you. We're going to be asking maybe um, some additional questions um, as, in, as part of our evaluation process because we are learning as we go. So we appreciate you guys learning with us as well. Sheila, I'm going to hand it over to you to talk a little bit about the, um, what we're going to be doing in this session, and then we'll take some time to do introductions of the whole group in a minute now that we hopefully have, our, have folks uh, coming along here. There we go. Yeah, so today really is about just kind of orienting ourselves towards the program and the weeks we're gonna to spend together. Um, we've got two teams in this cohort. Uh, thanks for coming along with the virtual uh, pilot, as Polly had said. Um, really what you, we want you to take away from this is um, a definition of service enterprise concepts, a little bit about the history and the research. Do know that all of everything we go over today is in your participant materials that Polly had emailed earlier. And um, certainly we can answer questions along the way, but uh, part of the virtual cohort will be uh, a good percentage of homework for your team to do when we're not all together um, online. That does a couple things that helps you build your team uh, muscle a little bit more and also um, alleviates the eye strain of being in constant video uh, meetings all the time. So hopefully we can find a nice mix there and a balance that works for everyone. Um, 
The other piece we want to do uh, today is really identify the benefits of becoming a service enterprise and, and what you can leverage once you have that accreditation. So that's really what we're looking at for today. All right. So let's do some of these introductions now and uh, maybe just I'm going to go with uh, who I see on my screen, or I'll look at my participant list. That's actually the best practice we have, I think, um, is just to start with who's on our participant list in, in what order. So I'm going to ask Laura to start and just tell us a little bit about um, what MACV has to offer um, and, and what, what they'd like to get out of the organization, out, out of this process. I'm sorry, Sheila, I just totally stepped on your, on your slide here, but my name is Laura Jensen, and I'm the Vet Law Program Coordinator for MACV. Um, MACV helps, our, our mission is to end veteran homelessness in Minnesota. And we do this by helping with housing, employment, and legal issues. Um, we do have three regions, uh, North in Duluth, South in Mankato, and then the Metro, we're in St. Paul. Each region has a housing and employment team but the legal team is just based out of St. Paul and we go statewide. Um, I do manage the, the legal volunteers for um, vet law. We do have um, other opportunities for volunteerism through um, large, like I was saying earlier, larger events stand down where we um, recruit from different um, corporations and community partners, um, do some volunteering. So I guess we're looking, we're looking for is to um, find out a way, the best way to um, obtain more volunteers as needed, obtain the right kind of volunteers to meet, the, meet our needs and meet the community's needs, and just a better way of um, maybe tracking it and seeing what the value is in all the, all the volunteer um, help that we get. Great, thank you. Well, the next person I see on my list is um, is Anna. So Anna, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself <clears throat> and your organization a little bit. Yeah, well, I'm um, my name's Anna, and uh, I work at Upworks, Minnesota, and um, I'm the administrative assistant there, and I'm, I'm going to be taking on some new tasks, learning some new stuff, and they just thought this would be good for me to attend so I could get some good information because I'm learning still learning stuff so and what i heard about you from nina is that she was grooming you for quite a while to take on the volunteer engagement work and that she feels really confident that you're the right person for this and is really glad that you're part of the team so i'm passing that on from what i've had conversations with her about yeah next i see lisa lisa if you wouldn't you know tell us maybe a little bit more about upworks as well as yourself you bet. Uh, so Anna and I work together at Upworks. Um, I'm the executive director. I came on last August, so I'm just about at a year mark. Um, what Upworks does, which I love, is um, we have many different programs, but we come alongside people coming out of crisis, prison addiction, trafficking abuse, and we help them rebuild their lives um, and restore their families. And we have another half of our, of our focus is on prevention, you know, largely in Title I schools, where the majority of kids are on free and reduced lunch. And now, um, during COVID and post-race riots, we've actually begun to do food distribution and getting needed supplies out to people in the community and some of the school groups that we were working with before. So we're, we, we tried to pivot real fast to be able to meet the articulated needs of the community. And I'm super, super proud of the team, Anna and everyone that has just knocked it out of the park. If you had told us in February we'd be doing some of the things we're doing, we'd think, no, that's nowhere in our model. But that is our model. Our model is serving people uh, the community and the way that they are asking for help. We also um, have created our entire program now on a virtual platform, which A, allowed us to provide services during the COVID season, but also now allows us to have participants and life advocates all over the U.S. So we're, we're real excited about that. Anna is an incredibly important part of our team. She isn't kidding when she said always learning. Every day she's just fire hose with all sorts of things, including being our data bank, um, database uh, brain and oracle of all knowledge at, at Upworks, which is, as all of you know in the, in the nonprofit world, is huge because the metrics you get out of your, your database system is what you, how you present to your stakeholders and your donors your impact. So incredibly, incredibly important. 
managing volunteers and making them feel loved and valued and important and needed is obviously a seminal virtue of Upworks and all of you. So this is a very important class and opportunity and accreditation. Not so much that we wouldn't be doing good work if we didn't have this, but everything we're going to learn in this is just going to make us stronger and better. And so I'm incredibly excited about this and very happy to be here. Great. Any, any particular goal that you see coming, uh, you know, that, that really made the decision for you to participate in this right now? Uh, well, we had talked about various programs in this sphere of influence, but always in, I try to help us focus on, you know, the best practice in every, in every sphere of influence. And in the volunteer world, I consider what you're offering to be best practice. So it just made sense. I didn't necessarily know what it would look like on the other end. I just knew we would be better and stronger after learning from you and learning with all of the other participants, because that's the best way to learn is to talk to other people that have either done it or are going through the journey at the same time. Well, we had, um, we had Kate that um, would like to have you introduce yourself, Kate. And then after that, we have somebody, um, somebody else that's, that's connecting. Um, and I'm not sure from which organization, but we'll find out when we get to that person. But Kate, go ahead. Hello. So I'm guessing this other person is Paul, who's another MACV employee. Um, mm -hmm. But my name's Kate Brown. I'm the development associate here at MACV and I, I've been here for a couple of months at this point. I came on with more of, well, I was a provider for about a decade, actually, as a social worker. And I came on with a couple of years of fundraising and development experience. And as you guys know, a lot of times general organization volunteerism kind of goes through it starts with development as kind of a recruiting mechanism for getting another way to support the organization besides money. So we're, MACV, we're kind of sorting out what the relationship here between, again, like program staff and like program and operation staff who are going to be the people who actually um, like put volunteers to work and articulate what the responsibilities of a position are, what the needs are for volunteerism in their program and department and how development, fundraising, and even leadership can kind of funnel the right people to the right, funnel the right people into those programs. That law, which is Laura's purview, I mean, yeah, Laura's done a fantastic job with managing volunteers and coordinating all of that. She's kind of a legend in our organization for just making things work, you know, but we're just, as everyone here is going to is saying, like we're just trying to figure out the new normal. And now that I'm on board, this is a new position, like what does our volunteer management program look like at MACV as we have increased capacity? Okay, and so it looks like Paul is still connecting the audio. That's what I'm seeing on my screen. Paul, if you're able to chime in, let us know. I'll give you a minute for that. And maybe we'll just keep moving along. So Sheila, did you, uh, did you wanna talk about any of the, I'm sorry, because I, I, as I said, I stepped on your introductions, anything that- um, All right, you'd like to we, we learned who people were and, and why they're here, that all worked out. Um, so a little quick overview about uh, Service Enterprise. So you can move forward a slide, I think there, Polly. Sure, I will do that. And one thing I'll just mention, um, is that I'm gonna just show you, there's a picture on the next slide of a um, of video that we have on our website that um, is sometimes useful to share with your staff. So I'll send you a link to that. Um, and I'm not getting my slides to advance here. So I'm just gonna, there we go. That's what I, you'll, you'll see as a, it's a nice four minute video that kind of presents the case for getting involved in service enterprise. So it might be something to share with your staff if you're talking about this initiative. So, go ahead, Sheila. Yeah, so really, um, Service Enterprise is uh, something that's been around since uh, 2009. And this initiative really is about creating capacity within your organization, learning from each other. And our definition for Service Enterprise um, 
Normally we'd ask you this, but we're just gonna go ahead and show it because I wanna have more interaction time between you all to get a little, a little taste of that team building and, and cross organization uh, resource sharing. But really a service enterprise is an organization that leverages volunteers uh, to achieve your social mission. And it sounds like both your organizations are really doing that well. Um, some of this will be capturing what you're doing well so that you can articulate it to funders. Uh, Kate, I think you did a great job of laying out what oftentimes volunteers come into your organization from, from different places. They might come from program, they might come from services, um, or they might come from the, from, from the fundraising ring, wing. And we wanna make sure that all of those pieces are working together, both internally, so that you as an organization know why that volunteer is there, what they are um, motivated by, and also what their skills are. So this is really a skills-based program as far as how do we work with the skills that volunteers bring to the program? How does that complement our, our staff positions? And I think um, with the, we, we normally talk about the trends in volunteerism. The trend we are talking about now is what are we doing in this COVID reality? Volunteers, how can we have them on site safely? Um, if it's not on site, what does our virtual reality look like? So um, if someone has an idea, and Lisa, maybe this might be a good question for you. What is this new virtual pivot that you've made? How is it affecting your volunteers now? I think that's the trend we wanna hear about a little bit um, from these organizations, right, Polly? Definitely. Sure. Um, the part of our program where we we come alongside, um, sorry, I'm trying to find a thought here, where we come alongside uh, participants with two life advocates, that now is available through Zoom. Um, and we haven't been doing it for an incredibly long time to find out if there's any attrition in the program for people that feel like, nope, this won't work face to face. I think actually it will be the opposite because oh. previously, um, you know, if you had a set meeting on Thursday, one to two, and one of your life advocates couldn't make it, um, the meeting would be can canceled. Or if there was bad weather, they either had to drive in bad weather or, you know, cancel the meeting. And, and you know, predictability and regular schedules are really important in these relationships. So that part's a, a definite win. Um, our ability to use volunteers through Zoom. And if it, because we're doing it because of COVID, but it was also because of COVID. Now everyone age, you know, nine through 90 knows what Zoom is, right? And a couple right. months ago, it was not a thing and people didn't know what it is. Everybody knows what it is now. Um, and lots of people think it's normal to walk around your house with a dress shirt on and sweats because only <laughs> this shows, you know? My husband sometimes goes to the kitchen and like, Zoom call? It's like, yep. Um, but that said, the other piece of it is, now that we're doing, like I noted, this food distribution on a regular basis, because so much in North and South Minneapolis, it looks just like it did post-riots. In fact, I just posted something um, on social media, the Wall Street Journal noted yesterday that um, it, their words, not mine, that everyone's forgotten about the Twin Cities post-riot and nothing's changed. You know, there's still no access to um, the grocery stores are closed. The pharmacies are closed. There's so many barriers to access for really simple standard things like, um, you know, detergents and diapers and formula and the things that we all can get easy. And, and the food banks have gone from daily to down to weekly. So to answer your question, the way I'm handling it right now, and this is a state of flux, but I'm asking, um, I'm letting people know, and my team included, it's up to you how comfortable you are. This is an opportunity to serve. If you do wanna to come to Upworks in our parking lot and do this food distribution or go with us where we're doing it, we have masks, we have gloves, we have hand sanitizers, but it's going to be difficult to socially distance and largely it won't because there'll be hundreds of people coming through the line. And part of what we do as a ministry, if you aren't comfortable with that, I let volunteers and my team know, you do not have to show up and I totally understand that. And some people don't, some people are not comfortable with that. Uh, and that's going to be the new normal for volunteers going forward. That uh, right now we're not having guests in the Upwork office, just our team, but we will be starting that pretty quickly. And then we'll have to do the temperature and the, you know, the very, the very high level um, physical. So largely to answer your question, if we can't do it virtually, we are going to continue to do it uh, in person, but always making sure people know you have a dignified, honorable way to say, 
I'm just not comfortable doing that. And then you don't have to come in. If you do come in though, like I said, um, people are people and people are human. And when you waited in line for hours and hours in the sun for your turn in the food line, you probably aren't going to be standing six feet from the person next to you, if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, and then we often help people carry their groceries and things like that. They're getting their food in garbage bags and they might have to walk 10 blocks. And again, you wouldn't be six feet behind them there. So try to be mindful of people's comfort level with that. And then again, um, the other parts of the, of the relationship we do online, you lose something in Zoom, especially in the intake meetings when you're trying to get a read on folks. Um, but we'll have to all develop the skills as a community um, as a nation now to be able to do that on zoom what we used to do in person because I, this is going to be our new normal for a really long time yeah thank you and and Laura are you finding some new reality with your volunteers the, the attorneys you work with well definitely we you know all of our clinics have been put on hold and most of them are held either at a VA facility or a county office building so most of those are you know, closed to visitors anyway right now. So we've had to cancel quite a few events, um, but we are managing um, inquiries from veterans. They have our, our vet law email and our phone number and the MACB website, and they can ask for help legally that way. So those get routed and we do do intakes with the veterans and then they're sent to one of our two attorneys in the office and they talk to all the veterans um, we do have, we are going to have a small clinic in Hutchinson the end of July. We're going to try that out. Um, normally in Minneapolis at the VA, we see around 80 to 100 veterans at every month. Yeah. We expect less at the Hutchinson Clinic. So we're just going to um, kind of put some um, safety measures in place and, and see how that goes. Great. Yeah. I mean, it's a work in progress. and. Yeah. It's comfort level, it's safety of your staff, it's safety of your volunteers. Um, so we're all gonna be experiencing this together as we uh, use best practices and develop probably some new ones um, going through this program. And I think one of the things that, that we thought as a team as we discussed, you know, why would people do this during a pandemic when everything is changing, when everything's so crazy, everybody's had to just react, respond, you know, it's really hard to get ahead of those changes. And we thought that this maybe would offer teams an opportunity to take a breath, to assess and, and to kind of get that, what you've already been talking about, where have we been over the last few months? What does this mean for our future? Because we're not gonna go back to the old normal. It's the next normal, it's the next reality. And so um, I, I give you all credit for, you know, kind of maybe using that opportunity to say, now's the time. So I'm gonna have Sheila give us a little bit of a taste of what the guiding principles are behind Service Enterprise. And that will, again, I think kind of jive with what we've just been talking about really well. Yeah, so our principles really are, are pretty straightforward and nothing that's going to surprise you. Um, hopefully nothing will surprise you on this entire call. Um, but first we really believe that volunteerism is an ecosystem. It um, feeds off all your departments. It feeds off what the needs are in the community. Um, what the skills are that the community can bring forward, what skills you can develop um, with your volunteers, and um, also with the part of the ecosystem that we don't ever want to forget is the people that we serve. Why is our mission important and who are we serving and, and how does that affect the way we use volunteers in a respectful manner as well. Um, the second principle is really about making it core and the fact that we've got leaders from your team uh, involved in this process is how do we make this part of our culture? Volunteerism is a big piece of what makes your mission run. And uh, we wanna make sure that that's embedded in the core of your organization and in the core of the community you serve. Um, then the, the principle uh, number three is this true community needs. So um, I can give you the, the, the antithesis example. If, if a community is getting volunteers that say, and this is something that we're already seeing after uh, what's happened, in the metro area and in some other areas in across the state but really in the metro area where um, for instance hands-on is getting calls from corporations that say we want to bring our teams in to do to help with the rebuilding of uh, south minneapolis where the riots happened and there's nothing for big groups of volunteers to do right now <laughs> the insurance companies are looking at the structures the the, the small uh 
organizations that might have been renting in some of those structures need to reassess how they can do their work, what that leg is. So the true community need is some of the stuff Lisa mentioned. We need food shops. We need people to have right away, what can we do for this community to, to keep them whole and to, to listen to what their needs are. So one of the principles is that we don't want to just use volunteers because volunteers want to come in and do stuff. We want to really tune into that need and match the skills with the need. The fourth principle is this investment. So all of you have great staff investment in managing your volunteers and recruiting your volunteers and the stewardship of your volunteers. Um, we also see that there's a lot of uh, investment just dollar wise in volunteerism and and that we're going to show you the return on investment um, throughout the program and you're also going to see that as part of your action plans what's the true investment that we're making as an organization so you'll know the dollar amount invested and you'll also know what the return is and, and what we're finding is that usually the return on investment is uh, between three and six percent but we've seen them up into the 10 15 percent uh, depending on on what your volunteers are doing. I'm seeing something in the chat. Of course, I can't get to it I can fast see it enough. And, um, Kate has a story to share about matching skills with need. And if you are if you are ready for that, Sheila, I think it might be good to just give us a little real life example of that as you shared it as well. Absolutely. Yeah, well, I mean, we get, we, yeah, there's so many people who are really interested in ending vet, in helping vets, ending homelessness, and a lot of them are, you know, are, are working in, in industries that are related to housing, but maybe not in a social services way. Like we've, one recent story, like we've gotten these really specific requests for, from an, an interior designer to come into like one of, into a home own into a home to offer her services and expertise for free, the vet, other people have to pay for the actual like items that she would recommend, you know? And then it has to be a woman that she works with, you know? <laughs> and it's like, so who can I work with then? It's like, uh, <laughs> like um. it's, no, like yeah. <laughs> when we're getting someone out of a domestic violence shelter, they're not going to be too worried about feng shui. You know, <laughs> like I appreciate, like we really appreciate the motivation and everything, but this might be the kind of thing where you just need to give us some money if yeah. you need to help. <laughs> you know? yeah. Well, and I think the great example there is that volunteer resources no different than a grant resource that pulls you off mission so we've all heard yeah. the story of of you know oh organizations that might chase a grant or chase a funder and say oh yes of course we'll bend our mission to fit your need to give us something that maybe isn't on track with what we expect out in our right program. and and oftentimes volunteers can have that sway with organizations as well so part mm -hmm. of it is the tools of having uh clean job descriptions on what it is a volunteer can do. And if providing feng shui is not in one of your volunteer job descriptions, that might be for a reason. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, and it is like it's, I come from the a grant background, like that grant, yeah, pulling you off mission, it's, yeah, it's rampant. Like you just have to be focused, monofocus on what you're trying yeah. to do. So you part know. of the, the guiding principles, um, it's, it's, across all four, this ecosystem. We wanna work with people and bring their skills, but we also wanna be mindful of our mission. Making it core, it has to be part of what we said we're going to do and that we believe that's what we're doing too. True community need, what is the community need? And um, there is a level of needs that go through our community and where, where does our mission plug in? And also that, that golden rule of, of where the money goes and what gets focused and how that is in tune with uh, your mission. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Sheila gave us a little bit about the what of service enterprise, what we're getting you, what we're getting you into. I'm going to give you a little bit about the why, the background and how this kind of emerged from the nonprofit sector. Um, and as you know, Sheila referenced, um, the 
conversation started about 2008, 2009, um, with people in the field taking a look at, you know, the sense that there's chronic underuse in some ways of volunteers and under, under um, a lack of understanding about how volunteers can be a strategic resource for organizations. So this, the conversation started with an initiative called Reimagining Service from made of people from the private sector, nonprofit government, um, that really want to look at how to how to get volunteers more um, strategically engaged with organizations to address pr pressing social needs. As Sheila said, that that idea of addressing true community needs. What so started with a uh, a data set because we started with some research that came out of the TCC Group, a consulting firm in the nonprofit sector, um, that had access to information. Um, through their core capacity assessment tool. And this is an assessment tool they use with nonprofit organizations that measured, measures an organization's effectiveness um, in leadership, adaptability, management, and technical capacity. And so they discovered they had this data, data set of about 650 organizations that decided to dig in to find out what do these organizations know about volunteer engagement? And what you see on the screen is the result of that. So these 650 plus organizations that again um, were I think folks that are responding to surveys like this are probably going to be in the stronger, at least the upper echelon of the sector that are willing to take a look at themselves and see what they're doing well, what they're doing not so well. Um, and even in these organizations that were, you know, doing really fairly well across the board, um, about 18% of them said they were weak in volunteer engagement. 64%, so about two thirds said they were they were doing okay, and though only 17% said they felt they were really effective in engaging volunteers. So the takeaway is that even with these strong nonprofit organizations, um, there's a real gap in volunteer engagement, effective volunteer engagement. And, and as that, you know, kind of um, was identified, we, we, um, the folks at Reimagining Service said this is an opportunity. It's an opportunity to strengthen this part of the nonprofit sector and in turn strengthen what organizations can do. And so in digging down a little deeper um, to these organizations, they, they, take, they took a look to say, you know, ask those organizations what they're doing well and not so well. And again, these are just standard volunteer management practices that you'll all recognize from retaining volunteers, to recruiting them, supervising them, resourcing them, developing volunteer roles. Um, and so the results that you see on the screen would tell you that only um, even again with these organizations, the highest, um, highest grade they gave themselves was 30% stating that they were effective at valuing and appreciating volunteers. So with all of these, all these areas in volunteer engagement, anywhere from 30% down to 6%, um, would say they were effective, which means leads a lot of room for growth. And some of the areas that organizations said they needed the most, or they felt they were doing um, doing least effectively, would be balancing skilled and unskilled volunteers, um, resourcing volunteers, giving them the resources they need to get the work done, and clarifying roles for volunteers. So you're going to see themes from this survey come up as we approach the materials in um, the service enterprise curriculum because these are some of the some of the themes that really will resonate a lot as we as we move forward. Um, the question, you know, when we look at those these standard volunteer management practices is what's going to be the the practice that really helps organizations move the organizational needle forward? What is what are the things that are most critical? So we'd certainly take a look at those ones that organizations feel they're not doing effectively, but we're also we also want to take a look at how we can increase capacity across the board with everything and some of the things that you've already talked about today, recruiting volunteers, making sure that volunteers are in the right role, that they're doing the right thing for the organization, that they have the resources that they need to get the job done. Um, so let's take a look a little bit more at some of the, the findings um, with our um, positive outliers. And this is, the, this is the organizations that were doing things effectively. And I'm going to have Sheila take a look at that for you. Get off mute there. Okay. Uh, what we really want to do is um, show a significant and marked strengthening of your nonprofit via your management of volunteers model. And um, that looks like a number of things. Uh, one of our organizations has this embedded in their strategic plan. So it's very bold and out front for the whole organization. Um, the key findings we show 
that really service enterprise um, picks up on these positive deviants in, in, in performers and volunteer management. And um, we've got five critical pieces. Uh, <laughs> Polly, I'm getting a wave. Can you take on for a little bit here? Sure, sure. And again, I wanted to move through this fairly quickly because this is kind of a little bit more of where we're going. But um, with the with the research that, that, again, formed the basis of service enterprise, the organizations that scored well that were were seen as using volunteers effectively became the, the, the subset of organizations that were that were um, researched around how they did these things well. And so, as Sheila said, the positive deviants were those outliers, those, those organizations that seem to be doing well as an organization, but also managing volunteers well. And the researchers started digging into what are, they, what are the characteristics of these organizations. And so one of the things they found is that any organization that had a strong volunteer management mo model was doing markedly well across the board. So all organizations, kind of like all boats were rising, all organizational capacities were stronger with organizations that had a strong volunteer management mo model. So that tells us that if we, if we work on volunteer engagement in an organization, if we, if we make sure that the best practices are, are in place, that there's a little bit of osmosis uh, maybe that it's either reflective of a strong organization, but it can also influence strength in organizations. So, um, one of the things we all, I would also say about that is that organizations that engage volunteers and have a strong volunteer management model outperform their peers across the board. So that's one of the findings from this research and again something that we are, are looking to replicate with the work that we're going to do with all of you. And one of the things that we that also emerged from the research was that it's almost it's it starts with any number of volunteers that when you engage any number of volunteers well, um, organizations are also, they also seem to be better led and better managed. So either that it's kind of a, a chicken and egg thing, maybe that, you know, if you, if you're managing volunteers, well, maybe it reflects the best practices across the board in the organization, but also that vol that improving volunteer management and volunteer engagement has an influence in the organization itself. Um, and so it's, we know that that correlation isn't causation, but these are some of the characteristics of these strong organizations. One of the things that we have, we also say when we talk about this research is that um, the researchers would say that there's, it seems to be that having about 50 volunteers or so is a tipping point that you can, you can get by with doing things um, effectively, you know, with volunteers on a case by case basis with maybe five, 10, 15, 20 volunteers. But when we get beyond that, then you really need to have systems in place. You need to have those best practices embedded and consistently followed. And that's where we say that, yes, having any number of volunteers manage well seems to be an indicator of strength in an organization. But when you get to that 50 plus number, that really is where the, the, um, the, the capacity seems to be improved markedly. So another thing that uh, we would say, this is where we were talking about service enterprise organizations, that they not only seem to lead and lead and manage volunteers and paid staff better, but they're more adaptable, sustainable, and capable of going to scale. So we would say that those organizations that have the fundamentals in place are, are able to pivot more effectively, they're more nimble, and they seem to be more sustainable over time. And I think we, we all know the reasons behind that, because if you have a strong and healthy volunteer base, you can do more, you have more connections with your community, and you have more opportunities to try new things and, and not have to make a big investment when you're piloting a program. You can bring volunteers in to help you move in a different direction. Um, and this, this is where that 50 plus number seems to come in, um, that nonprofits that have 50 or more volunteers seem to be able to do this well. But I, I also, also like to call out the fact that for, that's sort of a, it's relative to your organization as a whole. If you have a small organization, 50 plus volunteers might be unmanageable for you, but a, a good strong 10 to 15 to 20 volunteers may be the, the right size for your organization. So I don't like to get hung up on that number. but. The um, organizations that have a number of volunteers that's significant relative to their size in general, in order to manage them effectively, have to have systems in place that, again, seem to be used, used across the organization and improve the health of the organization across the board. 
Um, we also know that organizations that operate as service enterprises have to have strong human management resources, and those human management resources are mirrored in their volunteer engagement practices. We find that most of the organizations that we work with that have gone through the service enterprise process really start looking at their volunteers as unpaid human capital and start to elevate the, the support that they provide to those volunteers when they see the value and look at that um, look at that on a parallel with their volunteer with their employees excuse me um, so it's not about saying that you know we have two classes of people paid and unpaid but we look at what are the things that make for a good employee experience and how are those things how can we replicate those for the volunteer experience as well which means um, investing in our volunteers as much as we invest in our employees, developing them with training, providing effective um, and clear information about how to do the job, making sure that they understand the parameters of how their, their work impacts the health of the organization, the impact of the organization. So it means recruiting well, supervising well, training well, and that means both employees and staff. And that if you do one well, you seem to be able to do another well as in addition. We also know that, you know, again, looking across the, um, the findings that came, that um, became the basis of service enterprise, that when they looked at organizations that were engaging volunteers effectively compared to peer organizations that didn't engage volunteers, those organizations that were using volunteers effectively were able to have the same impact as those other organizations, but at half the median budget. So that's a bottom line um, finding that maybe boards like to hear, organizations that, um, have good strong communication um, between their um, between their program management and their financial management, um, their development folks. Is that um, there's there is a bottom line takeaway for having strong volunteer engagement, and that's that you can do more um, with that with those volunteers. And again, go back to that the stories that we were telling. It doesn't happen in organizations that are. Um, not engaging volunteers in meeting true community needs, not engaging volunteers that in ways that really impact the mission of the organization, because that can, as, as Sheila was saying, and as Kate was saying, if you, if you try to um, chase volunteers the way you chase grants, that just depletes your, your staff capacity to do the work that you need to do. It, inc it increases the morale in some cases about doing the work that you need to do. So we really look at this as a way to think about well, not just what money, money buys, but what that, that human capacity brings to organizations and how increasing it really has an effect on what organizations can accomplish. So those are the key findings. And again, that, that's what shaped the, the um, initial model of service enterprise, which you see on your screen, which was taking a look at um, what types of functions and organizations really can impact volunteer engagement. Um, and so this is the model that was that was derived from the research um, started started it by the TCC group and then um, built on by Deloitte Consulting, which some of you may be familiar with. Um, and the research was based on looking at high performing organizations to see how do they get to those results that they had. And this is where they came up with eight characteristics that were consistent best practices and critical practices for the organizations they considered to be service enterprise. Um, and so I'm going to skip ahead to the next iteration of this because this was the this is where they started and here's where we are today. We continue, consider these characteristics of um, organizations that are service enterprise and then we shape our service enterprise curriculum consulting and coaching around helping you achieve um, the best capacity possible in each of these areas. So I'm just going to do a quick review of those because you're going to see these again and again. Um, we know that organizations that are successful need to have strong planning and development functions. And as this relates to volunteerism, it means having a strategy and infrastructure for mission-driven volunteer engagement. We also know that leadership support is critical. And so for the folks that were you know, doing some research maybe on the service enterprise model or talking to either hands-on or Twin Cities, you know that one of the things you heard from us was you need to have your leadership at the table with this because it may be easy in some organizations to lead from the, the middle, but for many organizations, unless leadership is actually bought in and a part of any kind of change management process, then you, get, you only get so far and they sit, sit on the shelf after that. So with leadership support, we want to see demonstrated um, executive level commitment to volunteer engagement, leadership level commitment. So that might mean executive directors, boards, um, board members, um, even some key partners or stakeholders. 
We also know that resource allocation is another critical piece. And when we talk about resources, we're talking not just about money, it's there, but we also talk about committing um, significant um, human resources, um, tools, time, supplies to making volunteer engagement as effective as possible. We can't just bring volunteers in and turn them loose without the tools that they need to do the job, but also without the support and ongoing um, human capital from staff as well. Tracking and evaluation is another critical piece uh, because we know that we have to figure out what we're doing and see where, we're, where it's leading us in order to understand the contributions that volunteers are making and to also to understand the, the quality of the volunteer experience. Volunteers that don't have a good experience with you will not stick around. Volunteers vote with their feet, as we all know. And so tracking and evaluation becomes a way to look at how it is that um, we can under, better understand what volunteers are contributing to organizations and what the experience is like for them. Um, outreach is where, where we really see the um, volunteer engagement, um, volunteer recruitment functions living, making sure that the outreach that we do is relevant to the organization, that we're bringing in the communities and the, the folks that we want to support our work. And so it means that we're trying to make sure that we're doing a really good job of being um, ambassadors to the community about what we have and why people would want to get involved and having great messaging and communications around that. And on the bottom, maybe this is covered up for you. You see the little money bag because funding is part of the picture. <clears throat> we know that, fun that we need to have effective funding in place to retain and support volunteers. And so it can't be something where we buy into this myth that, that volunteers are free because the infrastructure to, to support volunteers sure isn't, we all know that. Um, and so part of being a service enterprise means having an effective plan for how you're gonna support volunteer engagement with money as well as with all the other things that make up that support. Effective training is another critical piece. And when we talk about training, we're not talking just about training volunteers, but we're also talking about training staff on their roles and equipping them to support volunteers as well as equipping volunteers to do the work that we want them to do. Onboarding and supervision is the next step in that, making sure that as volunteers come into an organization, there's a process to understand their skills, understand what they bring and can contribute, also to understand the ways to match them to appropriate positions clarify the expectations we have for them and provide ongoing support, training, um, and an understanding of their impact throughout their time with us. And that's part, part of where technology and communications comes in because we certainly know as we are all experiencing that technology is more and more important these days to um, support volunteers. In some ways we're engaging volunteers virtually. So having the right tools in place, having, um, having up-to-date tools that volunteers can actually utilize is important but also making sure that as an organization, we are, we are putting um, the tools in place that we need to do our job and to make sure that volunteers can, can have access to those tools. Communication is also important because we wanna make sure that we're using, um, using as many communication tools that are effective to invite volunteers to the table with us and to articulate their contributions and support not only within the organization, but outside the organization. And that helps with our next piece, that's in our next important piece, which is partnering to extend reach which is making sure that we have relationships in the community that, that can benefit not only our organization, but benefit our volunteers. It might mean partners that can bring resources to our, help our volunteers do their job better, like trainers. It might be um, organizations that we can partner with because we have a similar mission and that we may be able to combine resources like volunteers to deliver on that mission to the community. So it's anything that we do as an organization to extend our engagement and our reach and better serve um, our communities and better meet our missions. So those, those 10 characteristics are the backbone of the Service Enterprise Initiative um, as it stands today, which is why we kind of did a little deeper dive into the research in the background. As we go through this, you'll better understand how this is good, how your organization is going to interact with this because you'll go through a diagnostic process to help take a look at where your organization stands with each, with each of these 10 characteristics. Three of them we see as really fundamental. Um, planning and development, leadership support, and effective training. We talked about what those characteristics are so you can understand their importance, but we know that in terms of service enterprise, we're not gonna be able to proceed um, without having a good solid plan in place. So a lot of our work in our training will be around planning um, without leadership support at the table and without effective training moving forward um, to build on anything that we want volunteers to do in our organizations and, and anything that we want to have staff do to help support those volunteers and be part of the process of supervising and setting expectations for volunteers. 
with that, I'm going to just stop and see if there are questions that you have about this or any any thoughts as we uh, move into the next phase here. Okay, well, let me see if I have Sheila. If you uh, Sheila, not not working for you here? No, I'm back. If, okay. For cool. some reason, it was um, making me an '80s MTV video there for a while, but oh, it looks normal. Yeah. <laughs> so with all the 10 characteristics, we recognize that this is, a, this is really a cultural shift for a lot of organizations. It's about formalizing some of the processes you have in place, but it's also about adding more process to your system and adding more people and more input. And why would you take that on with all the other things you've got going on in the work that you do? Why would you do this? So there are benefits to becoming a service enterprise. Uh, organization and some of it is obvious when you look at what the 10 characteristics are of course there's a benefit to having leadership buy and of course there's a benefit but a lot of what we're seeing is that organizations are actually able to leverage that volunteer time they have more efficient use of both staff time and volunteer time and skills and um, also, you can see program growth. So once you start to articulate where your volunteers are working effectively, um, you can see great growth in that program just by naming what those skills are and articulating through your communication process what the, what the needs of the organization are. So you get far fewer of the volunteers that want to do, they, they believe in your mission, they want to do something, but they don't know how to plug in. You, you become really good at communicating with people and your recruitment process becomes really clear. So people that come to you, by the time they're signing up to volunteer, they're really clear about what skills they're bringing and how that can be effective. Um, so with this greater capacity, of course, you can achieve more with your mission and that, that is an ultimate, ultimate benefit. Um, to do that, oftentimes it looks like greater community, in, in, uh, greater community engagement, where you're now getting volunteers from areas that you had not previously identified, or you're getting a steady stream of volunteers for a program that might have been suffering because the volunteerism wasn't as strong, or you, maybe you're getting some attrition, so your volunteers from uh, older generation no longer can volunteer in the way that they did, but you've identified that the skills of a younger generation can, can be met with a mentor from that generation. All sorts of things have been identified in this program as a benefit from just being part of the system. Um, the one that is near and dear to me, and Kate, you probably will love this one too, is that when you have more effective volunteers and they're happy with how they're engaging with your organization, they're gonna give you more cash. So we've found that if you have happy volunteers, you also have happy donors in that equation. And, and that is always a win-win in my book. <laughs> I want to speak, Sheila, to a comment that Kate made, um, just because I think it relates to this. She said, um, to be honest, it's a bit of an overwhelming model, a lot to monitor on an ongoing basis. So two things that I would want to say about that is yes and yes. Um, it can be overwhelming, but I think for me, what I see the value is that if, you, if you're trying to you know, take a look at your volunteer engagement globally, it's hard to make progress. It's hard when you look at kind of the big picture, it's like, what do we need to do more effectively? You may know that, hey, we seem like we recruit volunteers well, but then they don't stick around. What's that about? You know, or it seems like we get just a certain type of volunteer. We want to have a more diverse volunteer core. So part of the value to me of having those 10 characteristics and the assessment process that goes with it is it helps you unpack it a little bit. It gives you a sense, and we're going to, I'm kind of jumping ahead here, but the assessment process gives you a sense of, where are we strong? What are we already doing well? We don't expect this to be a kind of like break it down and rebuild it all over. We expect it to be a process where you take a look at your strengths and see what you're doing well and how you're, the things that you do well can influence maybe some things that you're not doing as well or that you'd like to improve upon, expand upon. So I think part of it is having a more, um, a clear um, sort of roadmap for how to do that. And um, as you, as you, move ahead with this process you're going to see that we're going to provide you with lots of tools um, and lots of ideas but particularly the, on the tool side ways to assess and then um, plan and track the work that you're doing 
So that helps make, it, I think, a little bit less overwhelming because it helps break it down. Um, so you get to unpack all this stuff. It doesn't have to be this big kind of global, like, well, we want to do, we want to do something with volunteer engagement. We're not sure what that breaks that down. But then the how is, is what we're going to be spending a lot of time on and training and then turning it, you know, and working with you and turning it back to you of like, what does that look like for your organization? And how can you make that, make those moves for your, for your organization? Yeah, and really the system is set so that it's a way to cleanly communicate with other stakeholders so that it becomes a lot less work for each individual. We all share this together. We have a clean vision of who is doing what piece, why that matters, an understanding amongst ourselves. And it just, it once you've got the system in place, it becomes easier for everyone to do more um, without really changing how they work. You're just tracking some of it so that you can say, yes, you're already supporting volunteers. Or if you would only do this one piece with the newsletter, our volunteers will feel supported. And um, take direct action. That's one of the benefits of the program. So let's talk a little bit about the program model. Maybe that'll help with some of uh, what we're talking about as well. The next slide, Polly. Yep. Yeah, um Moving ahead here, there we go. <laughs> there we go. So you've already um, applied, so yay, that's done. Um, orientation is happening uh, right now, so we're gonna do a little bit with you and then hopefully you'll go back to your teams and, and share with them, uh, if you haven't already, a little bit about what to expect with the sessions ahead. Uh, the diagnostic is really about uh, learning where your organization is in this point of time but also learning what the perception of where your organization is. That's why we invited you to have multiple people from different areas take the diagnostic, because sometimes it's just through lack of awareness that people don't think things are getting done with your volunteer program. And the more, like I said, the more you can share that these things are happening and this is how it's happening, um, the, the better results you're gonna get because people are gonna feel more engaged and they're gonna feel more confident that if, someone they met at a program site say says, we'd like to volunteer, how we do that, you have a very clear understanding of where that person needs to go to take the next step. Or if you volunteer that says, I'm not really happy with how my volunteers are going, or they just leave and you don't know why, some tools to bring them back in or redirect their skills and efforts. Um, the pre-training meeting um, will happen with your coaches, correct Polly? Yes. And we've got two coaches, Polly is one, and Carmeet from, from MAVA is another coach. So um, that's about a two hour investment with your team. Um, we've also got training and coaching. And this is a, a five to 10 hours of coaching that is really catered and sp specifically tooled to your, your needs within your organization. So you might be way ahead in volunteer recruitment but you might need uh, coaching for how to bring that recruitment into a sustainable stewardship model. So we recruit a lot of volunteers, but they come once and we never see them again. Kind of uh, might be one of the examples. Um, as this is happening, you're all working towards your action plan. And what happens is your action plan becomes this tool that you can all reference. It's like a part of your strategic plan or it might be uh, parallel to your strategic plan where you say, we communicate via our emails, we communicate via our newsletters, we communicate via other PR opportunities, and we're tracking that, we know how many people we talk to and we know what the result is. That if we put a recruitment out there in our newsletter, we know we get 10 volunteers that show up, that kind of thing. What this overall action plan does is we submit that then to Points of Light to review and, um, they give you your accreditation. So then you become a certified uh, service enterprise organization. And of course, this, that takes about three hours to, to review the, the action plan. Then of course it just wraps back in and you become a continuously improving organization to ensure your compliance. Did I miss anything on that, Polly? No, I think that's good. That's kind of a quick you know, the training that we refer to here, that 16 hours of training is what we're gonna be moving into as you know, as we Yes. as we get into this um, this summer. And it's gonna be a little different because we're doing this as a virtual model, but I'll, we'll get into that in just a moment. I just wanna make note that that 16 hours of training yeah. is gonna look a little different than it typically does because it's typically delivered in four four-hour sessions. Right, right. 
Thanks. And so I'm going to just take the next, you know, kind of cover a couple of the next steps here, if I can get that to go, um, by talking about the service enterprise diagnostic. Now, one thing I want to note is MACV is already done with this step because, of course, you guys were geared up to do our spring cohort that was going to be an in-person cohort that got canceled. We have been planning to do this online cohort for a while. We just got to adapt it and move it to this, this point in time. So um, MACB folks have already done this process with Carmeet, um, gone through the diagnostic and the review meeting. So I'm just going to say a couple things, and I'll follow up with Upworks because I'm going to be your, your coach for that. But the service enterprise diagnostic is really where we take those 10 characteristics and all the information that you know has been learned to date about service enterprise organizations and have your or have folks in your organization do an assessment based on um, how that looks for them and so it's something that we complete online you can have up to 25 people participate in the diagnostic but the, the key things for us as we want you to consider who would do the diagnostic is we want to represent all parts of the organization. So not just folks that are involved in working with volunteers, but the key functions in your organization, your HR folks, um, development, um, program leaders um, that may use volunteers and those that may not use volunteers. We ask that you also have a minimum of three senior leaders, depending on what that looks like at your organization. Um, we, you know, at times, you know, organizations have involved board members if they have a really strong working board. Other times we would say that if board members are just involved in a governance role, they may not know as much about the organization itself. Um, and that may not be a good fit for doing this diagnostic. So that's something you can talk about with your coach. But we're really looking at is organizational capacity as a whole and the volunteer engagement practices. And organizations, um, you know, anyone that goes through the diagnostic um, just will be rating on a one to five scale different practices in the organization. It takes about 20 to 30 minutes, so it's not too onerous. And then um, that comes together um, when, we, when we bring together all the findings, then we'll be doing the next step, which will be reporting back um, those findings to you and having a conversation about what those what your take is on those findings. So the, the things that we, um, that we wanna make sure that you know about this is that it gives you a score for your organization a, you know, based, based on those 10 characteristics, but it's also compared to a peer group. Um, so your peers are organizations that are similar in the budget and the amount of the budget that they dedicate to volunteerism as well as the, the staffing that they dedicate to volunteerism. So it's not, it's not fair to compare, say, um, Big Brothers, Big Sisters of the Twin Cities, which is a large organization, is one of the three largest Big Brother, Big Sister organizations in, in town with a small mentoring program. Um, we're taking a look at organizations based on how you resource um, volunteer engagement and then what kinds of things are happening at your organization. But we wanna make sure that we benchmark it a little bit so you have, um, have an opportunity to, to see how other organizations that resource volunteer engagement similarly are performing. And so um, a couple other couple things just to mention about this is that the person that's going to be the said administrator, our main point of contact with organizations, um, will be completing a little extra information. And the, some of the things that we're going to be asking you about are your profile of your volunteers. So we want to understand that better and, again, compare that with other organizations like yours. And so I'll spend time with uh, MACV folks on this who are anyone who's going to be working on this, excuse me, not from MACV, but from Upworks. But just to, to say, um, you're going to be asked about volunteers that are your direct program volunteers that might be performing services to the folks that you serve uh, or performing services with them versus an operational volunteer. So somebody that's providing um, non-programmatic operational administrative management support as well as leadership volunteers. And we're going to ask you to, to kind of define those volunteers as either being one-time volunteers, um, people that come in for events, maybe episodic people that are coming in working for, you know, working on a project and then those regular ongoing volunteers. And so we're going to send you a whole administrative guide to, to kind of work on this, but I'll be doing some follow up with you. So just know that that's part of the process as well to help us get a better understanding of your organization. And then that's what we bring to the pre-training meeting, um, which again, MACP's already had with Parmeet, but it's a time to review the results of that service enterprise diagnostic. Um, and then give you, um, again, have a conversation to start thinking about where do you want to go with this? What does this actually, what do those results mean? What does that result, what do those results mean in context for your organization? 
What's the response from people that have participated in it? Um, so it's not just like, okay, here's your score, and now we're gonna now we'll see what we do next. It's really about what does that mean for your organization, and what are the kinds of things that you want to take away and build on. Um, and so this is something we like to do with anybody that's anyone that's taken this diagnostic. We like to have everybody at the meeting so they can see the results of that. And that's when um, you know we'll we'll be probably doing this online um, because we're still in an online wor online world. But after that, we're going to be providing the service enterprise training. Um, and that we ask that you, we want to get this completed before the training starts because we really want this to be the basis of the planning that you do within the training. So you have, it's not just based on some, um, some model that doesn't make sense, but it's based on what are the kinds of things that you've already identified as your strengths, as your areas of improvements and areas of improvement. And then that's the, what will be forming the basis of the plan that you work on within that training and beyond that in, um, with other training and any coaching and consulting. So this is the outlay of the training. Um, these are the kinds of things that we're going to be talking about within our six sessions. And this is something that um, you, you've got the packet from me. This, this training model may look different from what's in your packet since we adapted that those four session, four hour sessions to an online, um, an online version that's going to be broken up into six different sessions. You've already gotten the schedule, so you know they're two hour sessions. And we feel like we're probably going to be covering um, all this material um, in, in those two hour sessions, but th those two hour sessions also will include, sometimes you just get everybody, you know, sitting down, getting, getting people involved in the training um, and doing some breakout time for your organization um, during that two hours. So this is the, um, these are the content areas and I'm gonna send you something that will give you a little bit more about what's happening in each of those sessions because you may have people that are gonna kind of maybe come to not, you know, to some of the sessions and not all the sessions. And so this will be an opportunity for you to say like, oh, this is a, this is a good session, say for our HR person to come to or our development person to come to. We're gonna talk about laying the foundation. So talking more about service enterprise concepts, what are the things that we need, to, that we're gonna be taking a look at, what's going on at your organization, what your vision is for volunteer engagement. We'll be um, in the next session, we'll be talking about building internal support for and change management. Um, the next session after that, we'll be building external support. We're also gonna be talking about creating sustainability um, for the process so that it's, this isn't a one and done process, but it becomes part of what Sheila referred to, that continuous improvement process. We're gonna be also talking about getting ready for success, how it is that you communicate what you're doing, what it is that you wanna share with your stakeholders, how you, um, how you re-gear and um, communicate about the, the re-gearing that you're doing around volunteer engagement. And then we're also going to be using that last session of moving to success as an opportunity for you to um, create a presentation around what you've been doing for your key stakeholders. It might be staff, it might be board, it might be your volunteers. So part of the process is helping you not only plan for the future, but also communicate about what your plan is. Um, the, the six sessions that we're going to be, that we have will include some time within the session for your group to gather and talk to each other. We're also going to be giving you some homework in between times because in order to convert that 16 hour training to what we have here, we've, we've, we're tried to um, streamline some of the in-person activities that we do and outsource them a little bit to you as a group. So we're going to expect that you do a little bit of work in between times whether it's gathering as a group afterwards or it might be after the training is done. And again, this is a pilot for us. So we're gonna be looking for your feedback about, is it going too fast? Is it going too slow? Are we giving you the fire hose of, of too much information? Um, so we really wanna work with you to understand how the process is gonna be, <clears throat> excuse me, understand how the process is going to be most effective. Um, and during this time, in, throughout the training, we're gonna be giving you some um, tools to use, a workbook that will be um, a way to track what you've been doing together as a team. And so we also, and we'll be sending you materials um, digitally, but we also have a, um, kind of the, the paper version of everything that we'll provide to your team leads as well. So you have a reference point for that. Um, so Sheila, anything else that you'd want to say about the training process? Because I just dumped a lot of information in a hurry about that, but we'll be, we'll be talking a lot about more that more as we go along. Yeah, and I just want to underline what Polly said that this is a pilot and we are really open to your feedback, especially you two site leads, as to 
that's unreasonable for our team to, to work on homework in that way. So we did it this way and we came up with something that works for us. Um, never be afraid to, to offer solutions that work better for you because we want to be able to, to customize this to you because it's a small cohort. But we also want to make sure that uh, moving forward, um, the work that you're doing helps us as we build with other organizations too. Um, as for the coaching, this is an ongoing process. We want to work with your needs. We know your different organizations. We know you work with, there are some ways you work with volunteers in the same manner and, and method, but there are some ways that you're really unique and that's not um, always a cookie cutter situation. Um, some of the things we've done in the past are help uh, re-engineer employee and volunteer positions and job descriptions. What does that look like if you've got volunteers that supervise other volunteers? How is that different from staff vol supervising volunteers kind of scenario? Um, training for employees on volunteer management has been huge. How do you help other employees in your organization work with volunteers in an effective and systematic way? And also in a respectful way because oftentimes we've seen um, programs that have services they provide and once a client no longer needs your services they might turn around and become a volunteer and and what kind of learnings can you get from that uh, and if you don't do that can you learn from other organizations that have been through this process or um, nationwide is there a like organization that might be a good partner the recruitment of skilled based volunteers we know that you've got attorneys and that's a certain skill set uh, you're working with so that, that'll be an important one for you. What does the skill-based recruitment look like? Um, volunteer tracking and systems. So this might be something that, Anna, you're like chomping at the bit. We've got all this data. What, are we tracking what everyone else tracks? Do our volunteers have a great experience with us versus if they volunteer somewhere else? Um, how are we doing? And are we tracking it? And then that, that, that almighty return on volunteer investment. Another thing that you might want a little coaching with. How do we track this in a meaningful way in a, in a, in a data way that is respected by maybe someone on our, our board who says, I want to return the investment dollar amount and are we doing that correctly and, and can we share that? So some of the coaching that, that we've offered up for other organizations that is available to you as part of this program. The next piece is I want to talk about is the certification. And Sheila, I would say maybe we should skip ahead with this because this is yeah. really it's something we're going to cover during training. It's really just talks about the characteristics again and in you know the process that we're going to use to assess that. That might be something that we want to we don't need to talk about right now. I agree. I was thinking the same thing. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> and then um, as Sheila covered, you know, this is really considered to be a continuous improvement process. So we're going to follow up with you to see the kinds of things that you're that you've identified as changes that you want to make and what progress you're making with that. Um, we want to make sure that your organization continues to be committed to continuous improvement. Um, there's a, a three year cycle for certification. So it's not something again that we want you to put on the shelf when you're done. We want to make sure that you are maintaining um, the action plan that you're working on. We want to provide you with the resource um, resources and training throughout the time that you're active with us, um, not only through the initial year, first year or so, but after that and can keep you connected with other service enterprise organizations. So we'll be following up and checking in with you, but we're always gonna be available to you to provide any kind of support. And yeah, again, anything that will support your continuous improvement. I'm gonna skip over the history of service enterprise, but it's here in the slides if you're interested about where it kind of started and where it went. Um, we are at the point right now, and this probably needs to be updated, but there are over 550 certified service organizations in the country, and that certification comes through points of light as you, we've been referring to. So by participating in this process and achieving certification, you'll be part of an elite group of organizations. And these are some of the partners that would, were, have been involved in um, shaping the initiative, um, resourcing it, and continuing to support it, everything from Corporation for National and Community Service, as I refer to, um, Points of Light, which is our key national partner, um, the researchers that continue to be involved through the from the RGK session, Center at University of Texas, Austin, and the TCC group. So here's, a, here's where we kind of wade into the meat of the details for this cohort. Um, you know that we are on track to get started with our training on July 30th. All of our training sessions are gonna be Thursdays from 10 to noon. They're all gonna be on Zoom. So um, we, are, we wanna have the said 
process and the review completed by July 30th. And again, NACV, you're already ahead of the game, so great. Um, Upworks, I'll be working with you to get this started. And it, again, doesn't take too long, but it's sometimes more a matter of getting people to the table once we have that um, this diagnostic done so we can review the results. So we'll be in touch about that. Um, for the orientation, if you have team members that want more information, you can certainly have them review the recorded webinar before the first training session. You can have them review the packet that I sent out to the team leads. Um, and I think that went to Nina and Lisa um, at, at Upworks, but we can make sure that you get that. Um, and then also, again, really short, <clears throat> a really short orientation to what Service Enterprise is all about is that four minute video that I'll send you the link to as well. Um, the, the training sessions are gonna be fast and furious every week between the end of July and the end of August. And then the last session, we take a week off because that's Labor Day week, but then we come back on September 10th to wrap things up and that's when you're gonna be doing your group presentations. And so that's kind of a fun way to wrap up the whole experience and share what you've been learning and what you'll be sharing with your teams as you go forward. We're gonna get more information out to you about the content of each of those sessions so that you can get a sense of what it is, um, what's happening at each of those sessions and who might you might wanna have participate if people aren't gonna be available for the whole sessions. Um, this is where we talk about, you know, a little bit more about our expectations for doing this virtually. Um, as I said, we've been planning to do a virtual cohort for some time. So we had a lot of, a lot of skin in this game. And then um, we didn't plan to do it at this time because we were, had our, our live um, cohort that was ready to go this spring that, was, that MACV was part of. And so we are in many ways shifting a little bit about our expectations. So that's where, as when Sheila says, this is a pilot, um, part of it is that we are even, um, we are learning some things on the fly about how we want to do this, this process. Initially, we had expected that we'd be able to do this virtual process with having teams gathering in one place. So everybody's sitting down in a conference room and then being connected um, with a couple other organizations that were doing this work together. And I think even that expectation shifted. I don't think that we're going to be sitting in conference rooms anytime soon, but we are going to be adapting this process for um, having people participate remotely from individual locations and that's a little different than what we expected so that's why we're going to be uh, we're a little bit in the experimental stage about that um what the what we need to have in place to make this happen virtually is we need to know that everybody that participates has access to high-speed internet um, so that they can they can use the zoom zoom platform effectively um, i would also say that a lot of the um our, a lot of our initial planning around this was looking at greater Minnesota and some of the challenges that folks experience in greater Minnesota around broadband um, and digital access. We know that that is not the case for folks in the Twin Cities, not in the same way anyway, but we do want you to alert us if you have anybody that, you know, may not be able to participate, um, you know, in terms of having that access to high-speed internet or the tools or the technology that you're using. We're using the Zoom platform so that we can see each other. Um, we are gonna be using some of the features of Zoom like breakout groups so that you can move um, into a breakout room with people from your same organization. So you get a chance to talk to each other. And so we're gonna be, again, experimenting with that a little bit. Um, that's how that team-based training is gonna be able to work. And we, so we wanna make sure that you can make arrangements not only to gather online for those training sessions, but also to complete work together that you might be starting in that training session. Um, other things that we know are important for any of our service enterprise trainings are that we have participation by leadership staff on a consistent basis, um, that we have some consistent engagement. So we have a, um, <clears throat> excuse me, we have at least three people that attend all six training sessions so that if there are people that have to dip in and out, there's somebody that can get them up to speed, somebody that can serve as the lead um, convener and communicator. We know that there's going to be time for additional work between sessions. How you organize that's up to you. And that's where, as Sheila said, we really will need your feedback if like the pace isn't going to work or you just are not able to get together between sessions. We're going to give you a couple homework assignments. We don't think that those are going to be onerous, but it's really so that we can keep the training moving forward. Um, whereas in our, you know, when we did four hour training sessions, we'd have the luxury of doing a breakout or a different type of conversation with the group as a whole. We want to continue to have those interact interactive aspects in place. So that's where we are really going to be look, looking for your feedback about what works and what doesn't work. <clears throat> Something else that's really critical for this process, whether it's live or virtual, 
is that we have one person identified from each organization as the site lead. So that's the person that's going to convene the team, guide their participation, maybe manage their technology needs. Again, when we were anticipating that it was going to be um, people gathering together in conference rooms, that would be the person that makes sure you're all online for this. So however that works for your organization, we're here to support you with that. But we do know that it, it works a lot easier for the process if there's one key point of contact for us as an org, you know, as a coaches and the um, conveners, as well as for your organization. So that person maybe will get an email telling, telling them what your group needs to do to prepare for the session, and then we'll be the person to communicate with the rest of your team. So that's one part. And again, that site lead role is, is pretty critical. So <clears throat> this is what we expect of those site leads to serve as the main point of communication and distribution for, and we said printing materials, obviously that's not gonna be the case if, um, if people are still individually you know, participating from their own homes, but we're gonna be sending materials digitally. Um, and so we have that to, um, make, to make sure that you get out to everybody on your team. If there's any supplies that might be needed, um, again, not necessarily for this iteration, but if you need to have some time <clears throat> offline to do some work together, that may be important. Um, managing the tech setup for everybody or finding somebody within your organization that can be your tech guru if you need it. I, again, we feel like everybody's had a lot of experience on Zoom, but if there's anyone on your staff that you feel might need some extra help or support, making sure that they understand um, what the expectations are around technology and having some help with that would be appreciated. And again, that's something the site lead can coordinate. We also wanna make sure that <clears throat> people that miss sessions are, you know, are, have a sense of what's going on. So that site lead is a person that's gonna connect with them to ensure continuity. It's gonna help complete the homework for each session. And we're really looking at the site leads as being that point of contact for us about providing feedback to the training team and doing the final evaluation with us about the process pieces, not just the content, but how did this work for your group? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, we'll be sending some of this out just so you, as a reminder, so you don't have to get it all today, but our expectation for those two hour sessions uh, is that everything um, is ready to go by 10, 15, but we use that first 15 minutes to get everybody set up and online. So we have that so that as you plan it in calendars, you know that 10 to noon time is as much time as we're gonna, we're gonna expect from you within the training sessions. We're gonna be asking that the site lead ensures that everybody is gathered and ready for that 10, 15 start, but we have that bumper time to make sure that everybody you know, has their tech questions answered if they can't get on or things like that, we'll have that fixed. We may need to have some, have your group take different roles within this training. So there might be somebody that's a note taker or re, somebody to report out. Um, we're going to be using the chat for questions, not only about um, the session as a whole, but when we have, you know, we have um, questions for your group to talk about. So somebody that can respond in chat will be um, important. So having, having somebody that's a good typist on your team, um, having somebody that can be a timekeeper, will be providing reminders and things like that. But we want to make sure that, that you're ready to, to share those roles or have those roles assigned and that we don't have to negotiate that every time. We are asking that people use their computer audio and microphone if possible um, with a call in line as a backup. And you know, with Zoom, you can just easily connect um, through your phone. But if there's any problems that you see people having either with um, using video or audio, um, let's talk about that beforehand, get that resolved beforehand. We're using the chat box, as I said, to you know, ask general questions. We'll be, we'll be using some chat pods if we can um, and guided group discussions in the Zoom breakout rooms, but those are the things that, um, that we'll use to, to manage interactions so that we can keep, keep things flowing, but we don't want you just sitting in front of a screen for an hour and a half, two hours. We wanna make sure it's something you actually get to have some conversation um, with each other um, as well as across your organizations. Um, we do like people to be muted otherwise, because especially as we're working at home, there can be distractions and it can be things that are, that are happening that we have no control over. So sometimes mute is our, is our best friend for that. Um, we are also, oh, excuse me, we're also asking that um, the site leads will use that last 15 minutes of that two hour time frame to debrief with us after each session. So we get some immediate feedback about things that are working, things that aren't, aren't working, getting ready for the next session. Um, again, those are the things that we, we, we're trying to do as a pilot process to make sure that this is running smoothly for everyone. So a lot of information that I just threw at you, um, questions that you have, any concerns about doing this the virtual, um, having us as a virtual option? Speak now or? <laughs> 
Or speak later. <laughs> That's right. Speak later too. But we do what I mean, we, we really are trying, we have, we have almost a month, a little less than a month before we actually start doing our online training. So this is a time to identify any questions, concerns that you have, and certainly talk to your coaches about that. Looks like we have one chat comment um, that thanks, Kate's Kate. taking off. So thanks, Kate. Um, so let's talk about next steps quickly. I apologize. We're um, kind of lot to say today, but whoops, let me just go back now. Um, yeah, the next steps really the key pieces are um, MACB is really um, set and ready to go, as Polly mentioned. Upworks, Polly will be working with you to get you up to speed so that um, first session date is good to go. Um, what we do need is the names of the participants from your teams. We'll need their names and emails sent to Polly so that she can make sure that that's managed. Everyone's allowed into the Zoom uh, meetings at the time needed. and. Uh, I think everyone has their um, MOU and invoice and probably has paid maybe even too. So I think that's good. Uh, Polly, the, if we have a few questions, I'm, I'm willing to stay a little bit beyond, but that's all I've got for everyone today. Yeah, and again, want to make sure that we, um, we want to get the names of the folks that will be participating. And if you, if you want to just send us sort of a global list of who might be in the, the sessions, you know, all, you know, your, for your whole group, that's great. And then we'll continue to kind of make sure that we're um, understanding and, and just checking in with you about who's going to be participating in each session. It's not something you have to decide right now, but that will help us, you know, as we get ready to, you know, kind of gear the content for the number of people we have in the group. So we'd like those names by July 17th, just to uh, be able to get started with that. And then, um, yeah, any questions that you guys have about the next steps? Holly, I think we were going to discuss my request yesterday. Are we able to add one more person? Yeah, Is that okay? I, I mean, Sheila, I don't have a problem with that if you don't. That works. Yeah, that's that's works. Okay. yeah, I think that's going to be. I, I, I'm guessing they're not all going to be at each one anyway, you know, sure. but um, that no, would be great. It would just be really hard to cut down. Okay. Yeah, and we have a small Thank cohort you. this time around. You know, sometimes when we have like four or five organizations, if everybody brings like 10, 12 people, then it gets a little hairy, but we're sure. not gonna have that problem, I don't think. And I have one more question. You mentioned earlier about sharing the webinar, the four minute webinar. Mm -hmm. Are, is that a link you're gonna send? I'm gonna send you the link, but it's also okay. right on the, I'll, it's on the MAVA, um, it's right on the MAVA website right now. So if you okay. go to MAVA, the service enterprise page, on Mava, you can find it, and I'll I'll just I'll send that link out today. Okay, but thank it's you. It's a fun little video and just kind of a, a good motivational, like why would you want to do this? Here's why. Great. So Lisa, let me ask you because I know you're in a little bit of transition at Upworks. Who should be our point of contact for this work? But yeah, I'll reach out to you about all that after I meet with the team and and Anna. So I should be able to have an answer for you by next week. Okay, and so just get back to me on that. That'd be great. And then Absolutely. we're going to want to we're going to want to then kind of turn it around quickly to do the diagnostic. Yep. So I mean, just just maybe get people ready to do the diagnostic. It's going to be about a you know about twenty to thirty minutes per person, and then the next step will be trying to convene your group to discuss the results of that diagnostic. So usually we give people like about two weeks to do it. I think we'll give you a shorter time frame, and we'll have you crack the whip on people for getting that done. Okay. Um, but then also. Um, then let's talk about maybe even kind of pre-scheduling that before people get it done so we have it on everybody's calendar. Sure. So you that's bet. something you and I can communicate about. You bet. Anything else? I think I'm good. Well, good. You good? All right. Yeah. Well, we're really excited about working with both your organizations. We're really happy to have you on board and, and to be our partners in a pilot that we hope will um, provide us with lots of great experience um, to do this virtually in the future. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Thank All you, right. everybody. Thank, Thank you. you guys. I get a selfie recording.